The core of what I'm doing right now involves listening, and listening very deeply, and spending a lot of time in the dark, a lot of time in silence, a lot of time waiting. So I even think that what we consider darkness is actually the bright light of intimacy, that if our eyes were attuned to it, we would be blinded instantly. I was born in upstate New York. At the time, my father was finishing his postdoc. He was studying with Carl Sagan, actually. As a child, one of my rituals was to run up to the attic and lock myself away and cover up the windows and dance. Shadow play, being in the dark alone and experiencing the apparitions that kind of came with that. Growing up in the Midwest, there was this intense pressure to conform. I was like 12 or 13 and discovered vintage. That was so much more interesting to me than having an inverted triangle on my ass. <laughs> Fell into a wonderful group of misfits who um, were really passionate about urban exploring. So we'd find old abandoned missile silos and underground caverns. I found such a sense of sanctuary in cemeteries. Just felt in some ways much more alive than a more sort of civilized setting. The work that I'm doing now can be traced back to those kind of early instinctual rituals of going to the dark. I would begin to see things and sometimes they were frightening and kind of monstrous, um, but they were also seductive. My grandmother, her name's Doris, she's one of my great inspirations. When she married my Mexican grandfather, her German father disowned her whole family disowned her. The parting words that he uttered to her was, your children will never have any shoes. She took that sort of comment of her father and turned that into fuel. She would have a pair of shoes in every color. And so her closet was just like this boutique of rainbow everywhere. You know, she was always considered the one with like bad taste which actually means really awesome individual taste. <laughs> this is the one item of clothing that I own that wrapped around her wonderful body. I tend to mark time with art and fashion. So when I went to India, I found this bag in a market, but I just took a necklace and made this strap. This is from London. This is from the old Spitafields market. I love flesh tones with summer dresses shoes that disappear. So these shoes have a special meaning. They were the first really luxurious shoes I ever owned and I purchased them to mark the first major show that I had in New York and that was in 2008. And I've been walking ever since on that road. These hoes are from London. Every time I go to London I pick up hoes. I mean, the weather's so crappy there and they do the best hoes on the planet. I'm a huge believer in like texture on the legs. This is my uniform for working in the studio. It has the cosmos on it, which is very close to my heart <laughs> for all of us. They've kind of become my painting jeans sitting on the canvas, so I have to be in something really loose and comfortable. And I'm a real believer in glamorous shoes with utilitarian clothes. My friend um, Caroline Ventura and her beautiful jewelry line Brutus, I will probably end up piercing my ears in several more places just so I can wear her work. And it kind of lends itself to kind of creating a little constellation in your ear of little stars. I live here as well as work here. That, that intimate sort of tissue between art and life is something that I'm con kind of constantly cultivating and building. With fashion, it's funny with, you know, using body and presence and performance art. Uh, what you wear becomes quite important and so often a question, a creative supplication or question that I ask is what shall I wear? And I've received this, these directives in dreams mostly. So what I'm wearing on my head was a headdress that um, belongs to a piece and it's actually the dress hanging from the ceiling there. Actually it, it was accompanied by a dream about the performance, this luminous objects performance. My life didn't really, really begin until I moved to Italy. And I had this studio that I could paint in and fall asleep in and wake up like the next morning to the, the drawing classes. In a hardworking blue collar family, the idea of being an artist was completely not an option. I came back knowing that that was the calling on my life, undoubtedly. Everything kind of changed from there. I did a fellowship in gender theory and visual cultures because I really wanted to explore the representation of the body since the body was to be one of my key mediums. My most recent performance 
I would meditate for up to eight hours a day. This last run of luminous objects lasted for five days, so I was meditating consistently eight hours a day, doing so comfortably um, and joyfully. I found the first three or four days can be quite challenging. The body's always speaking to us, so what was interesting is when you're fasting for that long, the body eventually redirects its energies away from digestion to other things, and instead of needing to sleep for eight hours like I usually do, I was fully revived after three or four hours of sleep. So I, for a very short period of time during that performance, I felt like I had a bit of a superhuman power to meditate for long durations like that. Sometimes I feel like I'm walking or wandering through a kind of infinite void. Going to these places, it's interesting because it's not really about the darkness at all, it's about the light. But it's about trying to behold or opening myself to behold the kind of light that natural eyes can't see and offering my natural eye up as a vessel for a supernatural light. I had done a residency with Amnesty International and spent some time interpreting the stories of uh, women who had survived domestic and sexual violence. It's something that was in my consciousness for, for a very long time. Violence against women in general. I've had some close encounters with that. Instead of feeling victimized, I really wanted to use that as a platform, as a sort of opportunity to engage in a deeper conversation, not only with myself, but with God, with society, with other women. I think the underlying desire there was, how do we get closer to the real? You know, let's, let's get past the layers and layers of our cultural conditioning, and then we can actually start talking about art. And I just realized that, you know, art was kind of becoming this vehicle for creating, like, much larger conversation. Having exposure early on in life to a variety of in incidents where I saw bodies, my own and others, being harmed in some way, gave me this kind of empathy and this desire to see wholeness. You know, within every, every wound actually lies this kind of invitation for one's greatest strength. You know, so much of my art now is really focused on looking at these kind of disciplines of inspiration and how we really tune in to our core identity, who we truly are, so that we can make work, artwork, from that true identity as opposed to making art from another place where it kind of decorates a persona of sorts. The aesthetics of that interior realm um, very closely mirror the aesthetics of sort of the cosmos. So everything from weather patterns to storms to lightning bolts and uh, thunderheads and tornadoes and vortices as well as fractal patterns. Um, I've seen everything from the fibers of dark matter to, um, to stars being born through this performance. And it's been really um, surprising, kind of scandalous, because you, know, you think meditation takes you into this kind of peaceful, silent, empty realm, but it's a doorway. It's a doorway into a, a, an incredibly rich interior realm, because I'm stripping naked my creative process in effort to sort of be more generous with it in effort to you know, create a different kind of spectatorship, not the kind of spectatorship that fetishizes someone, but actually a spectatorship that invites wonder and inspires wonder and inspires that kind of participation. One night, I met a man. I had seen this man speak at a conference, and I was fascinated with his mind. The only way I really knew how to relate to men was by kind of seducing them and slaying them or something. I managed to remove his shirt. And he was very beautiful. He told me this story of God's love. I might have heard that story many times, but the way he articulated the story and the way that my heart heard it was entirely new. And for the first time, it wasn't about religion. It was about romance. I was utterly seduced, not by this beautiful man without a shirt, but I was seduced by God. I sent him packing. I laid on my bed and said, if you are who they say you are, I want you. Come inside. And the next day I felt the presence of God and it was like I had been living in a black and white world and suddenly there was color. 
the response that I've had to that light, the very few times that I've seen it, I've put my forehead to the ground instinctually and worshipped and been utterly afraid in a sweet way. Not in a fear-based way, but in a like a awesome, like <laughs> there is light in the darkness. This is what art is for me. It's, oh my gosh, a beautiful moments where you're able to translate something so great into language. And it takes a solid form. I talk about light as being my kind of core art material, um, but actually vulnerability is. It's the suffering that allows us to be emptied of our own strength. And then when we're emptied, we can actually be, we can experience a filling. And the kind of filling that happens in that state is worth living for. It's worth dying for. We kind of live according to this silly lie that beauty is decoration and that it's not absolutely essential. And it is the essence of the harmony of life. Without beauty, there would be no life. Without life, there'd be no beauty. Not to kind of confuse that with society's very strict, sadistic version of beauty. And everyone is deeply beautiful. We have the whole cosmos inside of us. 